1959 could be called a year of firsts. Motown Records opens its doors for the first time. The first Barbie is introduced, and Jimi Hendrix buys his first electric guitar. 1959 also marks the start of the Vietnam War and the first known case of HIV. While the city of Detroit is praised by the New York Times for having more going on for it than any other city in the North, racial tension bubbles beneath the surface. And across the state of Michigan, police misconduct, red squads, housing discrimination, and government-sanctioned censorship are cause for concern. But these abuses of power do not go unchecked. Because we've been able to respond to whatever the issue was of the decade, we have been able to sustain and grow. As early as 1953, there was interest amongst the National American Civil Liberties Union and the local units in Metro Detroit and Lansing to open a statewide office in Michigan. This small group of civil libertarians, widely considered the founders of the ACLU of Michigan, set out with one goal to preserve and defend the constitutional rights for every resident of the state. And for 50 years, that legacy has lived on. All of these men and women uh, spent their time building an organization from the ground up, and that's no easy task. I originally wouldn't belong to the ACLU because I thought it was a phony organization. Um, that mostly they just um, uh, took care of their liberal friends and didn't apply the principles to anybody else. And then there came a time when there was a, an event, a national event, between uh, Senator Joe McCarthy and the United States Army. And in the course of the Army McCarthy hearings, McCarthy's two number one aides had their security clearances withdrawn by the Army, peremptorily, as part of a strike back at McCarthy. And the ACLU came to their defense, and I said, well, maybe they mean it. And mean it they did. Early successes for the state organization were plenty, reaching every corner of Michigan and every facet of civil liberties. In 1960, they successfully lobbied legislators to outlaw systematic discrimination in housing. They are instrumental in establishing the first civil rights commission in the country during the state's constitutional convention. They stopped the Department of Social Services raids on welfare recipients' homes and they brought a federal lawsuit defending academic freedom in northern Michigan. Well, there were a lot of important ACLU people who were very much involved in the civil rights struggles in the South. The crowning one is the Freedom Ride. Um, what they did was they took mixed, racially mixed groups, put them on these uh, buses, drove into waiting rooms that said colored only and white only. They walked biracially into, um, into these places where they were tipped off by the FBI and the local, the local police were, and they were waiting. Um, local thugs, some of them with badges which they had taken off and put in their pockets temporarily, um, pistol whipped with police pistols, and one after another returned up north, those who survived. Walter Bergman was cruelly beaten. I have no doubt that he would have gotten back on that bus. But he couldn't. Even as the civil rights movement raged on in the South, Michigan was dealing with its own issues of inequality. Starting in the late 50s, uh, there was an attack nationally on malapportioned state legislatures. For example, in, in Michigan, the state senate was apportioned on the basis of geography, not on the basis of people. And on the basis of geography, you naturally get a very conservative senate. Scholl asked Sachs to take the lead as his lawyer in the apportionment cases. And Ted spent several years uh, fighting those cases. Ultimately, he was successful and had ACLU support all along. 
The young organization did not shy away from hard-fought battles and, in fact, committed itself to being a trailblazer in not only the state, but also amongst the ACLU nationally and across the country. We created the first Committee on the Rights of Homosexuals, as it was called. It was a forbidden subject. You didn't, you didn't even mention it in polite society. Well, we did. We created the committee, and I think it was a good 10 to 15 years before any other unit in the country had a, anything on what would now be called gay lesbian rights. By the 1980s, the ACLU of Michigan had branches on the ground in every area of the state. During this period, the organization saw many legal victories in the areas of women's rights, reproductive freedom, and racial equality, while also growing legislative and community organizing programs that successfully fought against private school vouchers, the death penalty, and the resegregation of school districts. From Saginaw to Grand Rapids, from the Upper Peninsula to Detroit, the ACLU of Michigan was growing at a rapid speed and lawmakers, residents, and those in need of a voice were taking notice on both sides of the partisan line. Many of the legislative proposals that come before me in the Judiciary Committee, uh, the ACLU witnesses uh, are, are legendary. The other side stopped complaining about them because they, they, they know that if it's appropriate, they will be invited. If you consider civil liberties and individual rights a core conservative value, which I do, and which, by the way, the American Conservative Union does, I think if you match up their, their opinions on various issues, particularly over the last several years, you'll find you know, a number, and maybe stated different ways, but a, a number that are, are in lockstep.